All right. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you're here today and uh, looking forward to this morning's event. Uh, we welcome you to the University of Connecticut School of Social Work Fall Convocation. My name is Henry Cantu, and I'm the Director of Student Academic Services here at the school, and I will also be serving as your moderator for today's event. Um, we are glad that you've joined us today as we celebrate the start of another academic year. While we prefer to hold this convocation in person, we are conducting it virtually once again uh, due to health and safety precautions. It's our hope that this event will return in person in the very near future. Convocation not only marks the beginning of a new school year, but it is an opportunity for faculty, staff, and students to come together to acknowledge the strong sense of community that is a hallmark of the School of Social Work. If you are a new student to our school, we welcome you enthusiastically and hope that you will seek out opportunities to engage in the life of our school. If you are a returning student, we are happy to welcome you back and look forward to reconnecting with you again. We are excited about the possibilities that this new year will bring. You will see many new faces at the school this year, and we will be introducing to you this morning our new faculty and staff. As one of those new faces to the school, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be part of this community, and I look forward to getting to know my faculty and staff colleagues, as well as the outstanding students who were part of the School of Social Work. We are also very pleased to have Dr. Isabel Logan as our convocation speaker this year. Dr. Logan's research and work involving police social work has garnered national attention and serves as a great example of an emerging area of social work practice. Her passion for social work is evident and you will come away from the presentation feeling motivated and energized as you embark on your social work education. I would now like to introduce you to our administration, faculty and staff. We feel it is important for you to become familiar with the people who are dedicated and committed to your success as a social work student and ultimately a social work professional. We are also fortunate to have faculty who are renowned and well respected in their areas of practice and research. In the interest of time, I will not be able to introduce everyone by name, but you will be introduced to key administrators as well as new members of our community. Our faculty will be listed according to their teaching focus and concentration. All right, so first I would like to introduce you to our Dean, Nina Heller. She is the Zach's Chair in Social Work and also co-director of our PhD program. Dr. Joanne Corbin is Professor and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. And our newest administrator is Dr. Jennifer Emanuel, Associate Professor and Associate Dean for Research. Uh, we, I encourage you all to get to know uh, these uh, important administrators and um, I know that they are very anxious and looking forward to meeting you as well. The office of the Dean has a number of staff members and administrators as well. You'll see Tessa Kugno is the administrative services assistant to the Dean and Milagros Marrero Johnson is director of strategic planning. These individuals are located on the third floor of the social work building in the Dean suite. We also felt important for you to know who the program directors are. Dr. Paula Neiman is assistant professor in residence and program director for our BSW program. Dr. Brenda Kurz is associate professor and MSW program director. And Dr. Scott Harding is associate professor and co-director of the PhD program. The Office of Research, I mentioned earlier, Dr. Jennifer Manuel. Uh, she, her staff also includes Kelly Citroni and Lindsay Wessel. Field education. This is an office that's very important. Those of you who will be doing field placement, uh, this office is coordinates that whole process for you. 
Dr. Nicole Campbell is the Director of Field Education, uh, and Nancy Ursinas is the Administrative Services Specialist. Some of the newer members of our community are in the Field Education Office. Uh, some of them are so new, unfortunately, we do not have photos for them just yet. Uh, but you'll see uh, Isolina Gilzine, Maria Kostinen, and Leanne Lesser-Smith. I probably am butchering some of those names. If so, I apologize in advance. Um, but these three individuals will be coordinating uh, the field experience and field placement for students. Their office is located on the first floor of the social work building. In our Office of Finance and Administration, Steve Marcello is the director and Iris Strong is our administrative assistant for that area. Our foundation office, director of development, uh, social work and Hartford campus is Caroline Tre Trees, and the assistant director of alumni relations is Abigail Johnson. In the office of continuing education, Beth Sharkey, our associate director, and Carmen Raglan, our financial assistant. And finally, the office of student and academic services. Uh, I serve as the director. Uh, and I have an outstanding team, uh, if uh, I, I may say so, Natalie O'Connor and Kathy Burney. Uh, I've already uh, referred to them as my left and right hand. They are amazing individuals and uh, they are extremely student focused. Uh, and we look forward to serving our students in many, many ways this year. Our faculty, I would like to also introduce, again, I will not be introducing each of them by name, but we wanted to uh, have you see them according to their concentration. Uh, we do have some new faculty members as well, uh, but you'll see the faculty members that are part of our community organization, uh, community organizing, excuse me, concentration. And next we have faculty that teach in the individual groups and families practice. This is our largest concentration, and so we have the most faculty that teach in this area. And finally, our policy and practice concentration, the faculty members that teach here. I also want to point out to a number of these faculty members who are not only teaching and professors, but they also are directors of some of our centers. You'll see Rebecca Thomas, the director uh, for the Center of International Social Work Studies, Catherine Leibel, the director of Yukon Human Rights Institute, and Tanya Rhodes-Smith, our Nancy Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work. One faculty member that unfortunately is so new uh, that did not make it into our slide presentation, I would like to point out is Dr. Joy Learman. Uh, she joins us with a principal appointment to the BSW program. She comes to us from Meredith College um, and again, will be teaching in our BSW program. So we welcome Dr. Lehrman and all of our new faculty, staff and administrators who join us this year. So we will be hearing from Dr. Isabel Logan in just a few minutes, but before we do that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nina Heller, the Dean of the School of Social Work. Dean Heller will be giving her welcoming remarks as well as make some additional introductions this morning. Dean Heller, I turn it over to you. Uh, good morning. Uh, and it gives me, and welcome, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our incoming cohorts of BSW, MSW, and PhD students, as well as our returning students, our faculty and staff, um, and our very special guest today, Dr. Isabel Logan, to the 22-23 academic year. We have been educating first-class social workers for 75 years, um, and very proud of that. Each year, convocation uh, marks the official coming together of a remarkable community of people who share a commitment to core sets of values, uh, both personal and social work, that privilege the well-being of uh, individuals and communities through the lens of social, economic, 
and ethnic and racial justice. Our goal is for each of us to come together in community, challenge ourselves and each other to examine these values, our biases, and our belief that through the acquisition of knowledge and skills and a willingness to struggle with societal issues, large and small, each of you will leave here with the proud identity and capacity of a professional social worker, enhanced professional growth and development, and a firm lifelong sense of community with the Yukon School of Social Work. That is our wish for you, and that is our intention. The university at large has three organizing pillars that will measure our success. One of these is life transformative education. I can promise you that social work education is by definition life transforming. Through your classroom experiences and your field placements, you will be both encouraged and challenged. We don't promise you that the next several years will be easy. We do promise you that they will be meaningful, valuable, and very worth the journey. While each of us in our community share certain values and commitments, each of us also has our own journey and story about how we find ourselves here today, embarking on a career, or as may be more accurate, a calling or vocation in social work. You may have had meaningful uh, contact with a professional social worker during a challenging time in your life, a relative or friend who is a social worker who you've come to admire, internships or volunteer experiences that led to this way to a professional path, inspiring classroom experiences that led you to want to study and know more. You may have been influenced by external events of the last few years. Many people were shaken to the core by the events of spring and summer 2020 when police brutality was finally recognized by more people, though people of color um, know painfully that what happened to George, George Floyd and many others was not new, nor an isolated event. You have all also lived through COVID-19 and it affected you in a myriad of ways. You and your family members may have become sick your education and your work life may have been interrupted and negatively impacted. For all of us, there was a heightened awareness of the disparate impacts on underserved communities and people in almost every domain, including health, economics, housing stability, educational outcomes, and available or unavailable supports and resources. Some of you may have heard for the first time about structural inequality, the historical and contemporary experiences of racism and white supremacy. You may have noticed for the first time both the existence of and impact of discrimination and violence perpetrated upon people of color uh, and LGBTQI folks and members of our Asian, Jewish, and Muslim communities, among many others. For others, those terms and experiences are not new but part of the fabric of your lived experiences. Over the last year, your faculty and staff have made a renewed commitment to keeping these issues front and center, both as they impact our own school community and the clients and communities we all serve. We will engage with you on these issues in the classroom, the field, and in the hallways. Please join us in this effort. Now that you are here, we know that there are times when it is not going to be easy. Most of you are working while attending school full time. Many of you are also raising children, supporting families, or living away from home for the first time. You may be struggling financially. Some of you and your families have sacrificed a lot to be here today. We want to make it worth your while. You have chosen to study at the number one rated school of social work in Connecticut, and your school is in the top 12% of schools of social work nationally. We are there because of our outstanding faculty and our dedicated and talented staff and the quality of our students and alumni. You will have the benefit of learning from top academics in the field and will read the books and articles in your classrooms that your teachers actually would. Our full-time faculty is joined by an outstanding group of adjunct faculty. 
These are community-based practitioners who work with the communities and clients that you will be serving in your field basements. Together, our full-time and our adjunct faculty bring their outstanding skills and knowledge along with their commitments to social work values and social work education to you. You will also have the benefit of superb faculty field and academic advisors. We have intentionally kept the numbers of advisees per faculty member low so that you will have the benefit of their ongoing mentorship. For those of you who are in field placements, your advisor will visit your agency and keep in touch with you and your supervisor about your learning experiences. Your advisor is a first stop for you as you encounter both challenges in your education and the successes um, that you will create. Please reach out to them. They are there for you and are invested in you and your future. There are going to be demands on your time and your energy. They will be worth the investment. There's lots going on outside of the classroom too, what we call the implicit curriculum. There will be lectures, panels, and activities, some of which will be in person, some conveniently online. You will hear about voter engagement efforts, opportunities to testify at the legislature on issues you are passionate about, and many other opportunities for learning and for service. I urge you to really make space in your busy lives to immerse yourself in everything this school has to offer you and each other. One of the most important um, things in your experience here is going to be your relationship with your classmates. Now, I was going to say, look at the person sitting next to you, but given that we are remote, do that in your first class. These folks may become lifelong friends and colleagues. The Yukon School of Social Work community across the state and region is immense. In fact, we have 8,400 8, alumni who came before you. Many of them will be serve as your field supervisors, your agency heads or commissioners, or even your legislative representatives. Yukon social workers are everywhere. Here are my wishes for each of you that you embrace this learning experience as the great opportunity it is, that your commitment to social justice increases exponentially, that you experience a heightened sense of humanity as you help clients, whether they're individuals or communities, to navigate difficult terrain while engaging the best of who they are, building upon their individual and cultural strengths that you are able to bridge the macro-micro divide, understanding that social work requires both close-up and wide-angle lenses and interventions. It is a pleasure to serve as your dean. Please come visit us on the third floor. I and our associate deans, along with our faculty and staff, are truly honored to serve you in this educational and life-transforming journey. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our new, uh, our no, our returning Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, Dr. Joanne. Joanne. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Yukon School of Social Work. I wish to welcome the entering class of social work students, as well as the returning students, faculty and staff to this 2022-2023 academic year. As a social worker, I am thrilled to welcome you into this profession. I'm excited to envision you as future social workers in the areas of health and mental health, working in elementary and secondary schools, in our community organizations and in policy arenas. You are absolutely needed in this field, and there is no better time to prepare for this work. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. As the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, I work with four major departments to create a rigorous and professionally relevant academic experience for students. The four departments that I work with are the BSW program with Paula Neiman as director, the MSW program with Brenda Kurz as director, 
the Field Education Department with Nicole Campbell as Director and the Office of Student and Academic Services with Henry, as, with Henry Cantu as Director. The faculty as a whole develops the curriculum, ensuring that the standards of the Council of Social Work Education are upheld, as well as the service needs identified by the community, state, and regional agencies. Your educational experience occurs within the profession of social work and is guided by the values set forth in the NASW Code of Ethics. The core values are service, social justice, dignity and worth of the person, importance of human relationships, integrity, and competence. You will hear much about these throughout your educational experience. As an academic affairs team, we make sure that you as students know the resources that are available to support your educational experience. This ranges from recognizing when students may be having difficulty attending courses or field placements, providing information about resources within the community or that can support your well-being and connecting you with university resources to support learning needs. We also look forward to providing you with opportunities to prepare you for future positions. These are just a few of the activities that we engage in. And as the Dean stated, your connection to the faculty and staff of this program will only deepen your learning experience. Please let us know how we can support your experience. My office is located on the third floor. I'm excited for you as you begin this program, and I look forward to getting to know you and hearing about the work you are doing in our communities. You are needed. And now we will hear from our Associate Dean for Research, uh, who began with us about three weeks ago, Dr. Janet. Jennifer Mann. Jennifer. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Dean Heller. Um, so, like many of you in the audience who are new to UConn or social work, uh, I'm also new to UConn um, and very humbled with the opportunity to serve as the new associate dean uh, for research. And if you're like me, um, this is a, a bit of a parallel process. You're full of emotions that might range from feeling excited, um, energetic, uh, and grateful, um, to being nervous, um, to feeling uncertain, maybe some worry, and maybe a little bit overwhelmed with information. <laughs> uh, so you're not alone. The feelings you have are normal, and I encourage all of us to lean into those feelings and rely on the, the community um, that you're that you're going to build um, the community of supports that you'll be built here at, at the school. As the associate dean for research, my role is to provide support to faculty, staff, and students in advancing research on many of the theories, interventions, and policy approaches that you will encounter in class and in the field and trying to make those processes for doing research as easy as possible and transparent. I remember when I was in my BSW uh, and MSW programs, I was wondering, you know, why is it important to take research? I didn't fully understand or appreciate um, the purpose of re research or its relation to social work. Uh, what does it have to do with me and my interests in wanting to help individuals and communities? Uh, well, it's essential. So you see, even though I do believe in the art of social work, the role of intuition and clinical wisdom, these can't be our only sources of knowledge. I don't trust myself to provide the most effective approaches and nor should any of us. We need to be self-critical of our biases and assumptions and have checks and balances and in different ways, holding ourselves accountable that what we're providing um, in the field is effective, equitable, and inclusive. Although it's not the only source and sometimes it's flawed, research is an important part of our knowledge base. And the bottom line is that we need to know that what we're doing is working. Um, we need to have the skills and knowledge 
to evaluate our work. And I encourage all of you to be curious while you're here and in your future as a social worker, think critically, ask critical questions, um, because we can't assume our approaches are delivered in equitable and inclusive ways uh, for everyone. So while at UConn, you will hear about some of uh, the incredible research and scholarship that is happening at the school. And I can tell you that our faculty, staff, and students are doing cross-cutting, innovative research and scholarship that address some of our most critical issues we're facing. And some of these areas include adverse child experiences, foster care, racism and oppression, health equity, human rights, trauma and violence, youth well-being, and much more. The work also focuses on groups who have long endured systemic racism and oppression, including Black and Latinx, Indigenous, Asian and South Asian individuals, LGBTQ, uh, and gender nonconforming populations, aging and older adults, um, our Jewish and Muslim uh, peers and colleagues, refugees and immigrant groups, and people with disabilities. This work is very much grounded in the community and informed by critical theories and principles of anti-racism. The, the impact of this work is significant, and I encourage you uh, to get engaged uh, in this work when you can. Uh, there are a number of ways to be involved in research. For example, you can um, work as a research assistant. Uh, there are training opportunities here at Social Work as well as field internship opportunities. And you'll hear more about these and how to be involved uh, throughout the year. Uh, we are also uh, working on expanding these opportunities uh, to think about how to bring students into our research here. So in closing, I want to welcome you and I want to invite you to visit me uh, on the second floor to share your interests, your ideas, or just to say hi. Uh, I'm wishing everyone a great semester and year at UConn. Go Husky. <laughs> Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Isabel Logan, who is our guest speaker. Dr. Logan is an associate professor at Eastern Connecticut State University in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Criminology, and Social Work. She also maintains a private practice providing consulting and clinical services. Social justice is a theme throughout Dr. Logan's work, and you will hear that today. She has been called to work with clients who are facing structural injustices within the legal system. She also recognizes and addresses the cultural, ethnic, and linguistic barriers that affect clients at the micro, meso, and macro levels of the system. Prior to joining the faculty at Eastern, she was a social worker for the Connecticut Division of Public Defender Services for 20 years in the New Haven Superior Court and Superior Court of Juvenile Matters at Hartford. In, 20, in 2001, she was selected by American University to assist with developing the cultural competency curriculum for drug court professionals. And she also assisted Connecticut's Court Support Service Division in developing their cultural competence curriculum. Additionally, Dr. Logan developed a program aimed at preventing individuals involved with the drug courts from returning to jail. This is one example of how her practice and research has led to policy implementation within the Connecticut judicial system. Dr. Logan is currently involved with police social work. This work is receiving national attention. Dr. Logan earned her BSW from St. Joseph College presently St. Joseph University, her MSW from Fordham University with a clinical concentration and specialization in substance abuse. She earned her doctorate of education from the University of Hartford. Dr. Logan has received numerous awards in recognition of her contributions. 
In 2013, she received the Mary Rosa McDonough Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of St. Joseph for her service to the profession and community. In 2019, she received the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Distinguished Service Faculty Award from Eastern Connecticut State University for promoting the ideals and values of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and furthering the goals of diversity and social equity. In 2022, Dr. Logan received a letter of appreciation from the Willimantic Police Department for her valuable service in embedding social work students into the police department. The letter of appreciation is the department's highest civilian award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Isabel Logan. Thank you, Dr. Corbin. Good morning and welcome to the 2022-2023 academic year. If you would have told me when I was 17 years old that I was gonna be standing in for Zooming in front of you today as Dr. Isabel Logan, a Latina, a scholar and a practitioner, I would have laughed. You see, as a first generation Latina college student raised in the North End of Hartford, my high school guidance counselor did not think I should go to a four year college because I came from a low income, single headed household. In fact, every year for my four years of high school, there was this constant back and forth with my guidance counselor who tried to discourage me from taking academic courses. He claimed they were difficult. My mom, the constant pillar of strength in my life, sent the most powerful message of them all. She said, you can do this. You're going to college. Dio ha prieta, pero no ahoga. And though that does not translate in English well, my attempt is to tell you that what she meant was it may get tight, but we can do it. Then she proceeded to tell me, tell him if he doesn't give you the college applications, he will have to deal with me. And you better believe I couldn't wait to deliver that message the next day. I also couldn't wait to prove him wrong. I was going to college and he couldn't stop me. I must also tell you that the sweetest revenge came years later when I was, when I was working as a public defender social worker in Hartford Juvenile Court. I was asked to attend a PPT meeting to stabilize an educational plan for one of my clients. As I walked into the meeting, this was at a middle school, I came face to face with my old high school guidance counselor. And I was ready for a fight, or as we say in social work, to strongly advocate for my client. When the meeting ended, my client had the educational plan he needed, and the words out of my guidance counselor's mouth were, wow, you still advocate first, fiercely. He's lucky to have you in your corner, in his corner. He then proceeded to tell me how he knew I would make it and, begin, and began telling everyone in the room how proud he was of me. I think he was genuinely happy that I never listened to him and that I proved him wrong. I just smiled politely, handed over my business card that in bold black letters um, stated my MSW credentials and asked him to call me if there were any concerns. As I walked away, I knew deep down inside that both he and I knew the truth, and I wondered how many other children he successfully discouraged. But most importantly, I finally had a seat at the table, a chance at tearing down structural barriers. This story and many like this one is one of the many reasons why I became a social worker. In fact, I can still vividly remember one of the first times I experienced the burning desire to speak up against injustices, at the age of 18, actually. It was 1992, and the verdict of the Rodney King case was out. A Black man from Los Angeles who had fallen victim to police brutality and the justice system failed to prosecute perpetrators. Everyone was in an uproar from the West Coast to the East Coast. That year was also the year that AIDS became the number one cause of death for US men between the ages of 20 to 25 to 44. Unemployment was, was on the rise. And well, I remember being part of the leadership group that organized a march to Washington DC. 
I became fascinated by the aspect of social work and law. In fact, before discovering the world of social work, I wanted to be an attorney. It wasn't until the graduate program that I discovered I could be a forensic social worker and combine the practice of social work and law. As I reflect on my social work journey in preparation to address all of you today, I realized that the time back in 1992, though we weren't going through a pandemic, sort of was similar to what we experienced in 2020, except, in, except this time the verdict for the George Floyd case actually did not fail to prevail. So I would be remiss if I tell if I didn't share with you that my social work foundation was strong and that it's not at all a coincidence that I'm in this space. I strongly believe that destiny was was already carved out for me and it all depended on how I colored it in. So when I started the social work journey, in my head, I thought I was going to be an attorney. Well, when I walked into the first professor's classroom in the social work program, this professor had a social work and law degree. Okay, now let's put that into context. There were four full-time faculty members and half of them, that means two, were social workers and attorneys. And they were strong, and I was intrigued by all of them. I remember wanting to intern at the court. Like many of you, I couldn't wait for that first experience. At St. Joseph's, juniors did about eight hours a week at that time, and so I couldn't wait. I wanted an internship at the public defender's office. And when the day came, I, could, I was like ecstatic. I couldn't even believe that I was gonna be walking into the court. I introduced myself to the public defender social worker as her social work intern, to which she responded, oh no, you're not. No one told me I was getting an intern. And she walked away, didn't make any eye contact, just closed the door to her office. Okay, so that didn't go so well. But wait, I promise there's a light at the end of the tunnel. In my head, I really did begin to panic. There goes engagement. I was trying really hard. How was I going to explain to my field director that I had no supervisor, but I wanted to stay? So I needed to assess the situation. I walked into the office head and I said, I need your help. I was fighting back tears just between us. I said, I wanna be here, but your social worker didn't even know I was gonna be her intern and I need a supervisor or I will not be able to stay. In his calm attorney voice, he told me, don't worry, Isabel, she'll warm up to you, it'll be fine. That entire day, I was on a mission looking for that one person that could adopt a social work intern so that I wouldn't lose my placement or at least until the social worker warmed up that afternoon, I had an emergency meeting with my field director. And before he even opened the door to his office, the tears were rolling down my face. I had held it together all day at court, but I couldn't do it anymore. And I couldn't even get the words out. I needed a supervisor and I didn't wanna lose my placement. Somehow my field director worked it out for me. I believe he had an attorney to attorney conversation with the head of the office because after all, he himself was an attorney or is. The head of the office explained that despite him being in the GA, which is the geographical area, which mostly deals with lower crimes, the JD, which consists of higher crimes, such as murders and rapes, um, was also connected to the office and that I would have the opportunity to work with that social worker. In the meantime, he would be my task supervisor. Well, you guessed it, he became the supervisor. And I floated around between offices and the secretary and the investigators and the attorneys and sometimes the social workers that entire academic year. I saw it as an opportunity. I felt, I felt important. I was in court. It didn't matter to me how people were, were treating me. I just wanted to be there. I wanted to be in that space. So, 
In the mornings, I would assist the investigator with the financial aid applications in lockup. Sometimes I would go in the field with them and talk to clients and witnesses. I read a lot of police reports. Other times I would sit with the secretary in the front desk, interacting with the public, or I would go to court with the attorneys and the clients. Also, the Part B social worker would give me these elaborate projects that would take hours. Okay, let's call it what it was. It was really busy work. In other words, she wanted me to stay out of her hair. But I found a way to make the best of it. I never once complained. I made it my business to learn as much as I could from every situation. I connected with so many professionals. Well, one of her projects to me was find out how many providers are out in the community, make a book, a booklet of resource for me, and let me know exactly what they do and who they accept. So that for me meant I got a chance to network. And I wanted to find out as much as I could. So sometimes I was on the phone with providers for a while, just being nosy, finding out what was going on. What did they do in their programs? And how could their programs help the clients in the public defender's office? Well, other times the part A social worker would steal me from the part B and have me join her in cases. I think she saw me trying to learn from every situation and she wanted to make sure I had a good experience. She was compassionate, empathetic, open-minded, creative, very knowledgeable in psychiatric defense. And she informally really adopted me. She wouldn't close the door. She would actually invite me in. She would look me in the eyes and she would say, hey, I have a case you might like. By the end of the academic year, I had interacted with so many clients and had a huge network of professionals that had become my friends and mentors in the court system. And that was reflected in my evaluation. Now, when my internship came to an end, I did turn in this huge resource book. It actually took all academic year. I think that was, perf perf that was on purpose, um, but I turned it in. It was neat, it was organized, and she was surprised. The fun part about it was that because attorneys knew I was working on this, Sometimes they would call me into chambers to discuss programs with the, with the judges in order to see if a client could get into a program. And so I used that opportunity to really learn about these community programs to find out how and, and where students could have, um, clients could have access to them. Now, my senior year was interesting. I interned at an elementary public school which I truly enjoyed, but somehow I kept coming back to the integration of social work and law. In that setting, I witnessed how poverty and children of incarcerated parents um, suffered in the education system. I learned how individuals are impacted by their communities and how laws and policies impact their education. By the second semester of my senior year, I knew I wanted to work in the court. So I decided to call the chief social worker in the public defender's office and introduce myself. I would call this poor woman um, about every week. Oh, I'm sorry, can you flip that back one more? Thank you, <laughs> my bad. Um, I would call this poor woman about every week. And okay, it was almost every other week and I did that for about four months. Back then, you know, email wasn't as popular as it is today. And so I just wanted to make sure she didn't forget about me and that she knew I wanted to work in the court system. So finally, one day she said to me, maybe about four months or five months later, she said to me, I will have an opening. Call me in two weeks. I promise. Send me your resume. I'll have an opening. It will be in drug court. It's in New Haven. And if the position is offered to you, you will get an opportunity to develop the drug court social worker role. Now, I remember being really nervous, but I also knew I didn't wanna work in drug court, but that was the door that opened. And so I was going to try it. So here's what happened. When I interviewed, I was told that they were so surprised by all, by all that I had done that they needed to call my college professor to confirm everything that was on my resume. 
They also asked me to submit a copy of my grades and a writing sample. And then finally, they said, we would like to offer you the job under the conditions that you complete your master's. Also, they wanted to let me know that I was the first Latina bilingual social worker in the public defender's office because they really couldn't find qualified individuals. They also told me that I might face some challenges because I was hired over a master level social worker who works in the same court that I was going to be assigned to. This was quite interesting to me because at the same time she went over that, she said to me that she was also surprised that I had an opportunity to intern as a junior in the public defender's office because they don't accept juniors, they only accepted seniors. And so she asked me how I did that. So I smiled and told her that when one door closes, I just either open it back up or get in through the window. And so she laughed and she told me that I was gonna fit in just fine because in addition to her wondering how I got in there, she had also spoken to the part A social worker, you know, the one that was compassionate, the one that let me in her office and wouldn't close the door, um, the one that gave me cases and not busy work. She had asked about me and that the part A social worker had told her about my work so that she was impressed. Well, accepting to work in drug court was probably the best decision I ever made. In fact, I discovered that I really did like working with individuals with addiction and that I couldn't have asked for a better job. I was part of a team that was building a program to keep people from being incarcerated, people who had addiction, people who had a disease that most people with diseases do not get incarcerated for. At that point, I was able to see firsthand how to develop a program from scratch. One of my first tasks was developing the mission. Another thing I got a chance to do was learn how to work with police. Our drug court had a community policing component and the police officer that was gonna be working with us was there to help work with the social worker to prevent people from getting into the system even deeper. In addition to that, we also had to build a cultural track for Latino clients. We noticed that Latino clients were not making it. They, were, they actually had lower success rates than our other clients. A lot of it had to do with language barriers and cultural traditions. Something as simple as greeting someone and giving them a hug or a kiss on the cheek, which was sort of frowned upon in residential programs. And so many of our clients um, were, were struggling. Because of our community policing program, as well as our Latino track, our drug court became a model court. Now I do have to tell you that it wasn't easy. When I first started there, remember the woman that was going to, that applied for the job that I got? Well, she had friends that were also part of the leadership in drug court. And well, sometimes I wasn't always invited to the meetings or they would forget to include my name in brochures. Um, so oftentimes I had to, I was either late for meetings because I didn't know about them and would find out and would end up getting there anyway, or I would have to really try and, and really make my point and work harder than everyone else to show that I too could do it despite being young and despite not having as much experience as everyone else that was there. Well, what was interesting about that was that after a while, I had this client that would keep coming back. And every single time he relapsed, he would say to me, Isabel, you don't understand. There is a counselor in our main treatment program that is bringing the drugs to the program. And no one believes me. So after hearing this a couple of times, I decided that I was going to tell the drug court judge. I couldn't hold it. I know people weren't listening to him, but I really thought that we should investigate it. Of course, the drug court judge looked at me and said, if you're wrong about this, you're gonna have a lot of problems. So despite being anxious 
and worried. I insisted. I kept saying, we need to investigate. We need to investigate. Well, the reality was that when they investigated, the client's allegations were confirmed. And so at that time, that's how I started to gain my credibility in the court system. That's how I became part of the team again. I was able to prove that I knew what I was talking about and that I was actually making changes and helping make changes to a situation that could possibly hurt a client. With that said, things started to slowly evolve. Our drug court became nationally known. We got to travel all over. It was exciting. I got to, to make um, connections with people throughout the US. Our main role was teaching people how to connect and form linkages with police departments um, so that their drug court could work with police and be able to reduce recidivism rates into the justice system. We got invited to travel all throughout the United States. And I got a chance to really, really work with so many different people, including the opportunity to help build a cultural curriculum for drug court professionals. That was exciting. I got to see how research impacted the, the theories and the policies that people um, were creating to help support drug court clients. Additionally, there was a lot of changes happening. In addition to gaining my credibility in drug court, I also was pulled to work in JD cases in New Haven, as well as GA cases. So I maintained a caseload of other clients that were not drug court involved. I learned so much about the system. It was amazing. But after four years, it was time for me to move on. I had decided that I wanted to go back to where I came from, Hartford. I wanted to work in Hartford Juvenile Court. I wanted to go back to working with the kids that I saw while I was interning at the elementary school. I also wanted to work with the kids who were struggling and could not get their educational needs met or who were actually being pipelined into, into the prison system. And so that's where I spent most of my tenure in the juvenile court. I can tell you that in the juvenile court, there were so many things to learn. I worked with drug court, with juvenile drug court. I had a regular caseload. And I also got a chance to work with duly committed kids, kids that had cases on the neglect side with DCF and kids that had criminal cases in the juvenile side. But oftentimes I would also follow juvenile cases to adult, adult court. And I can tell you that that's where I saw many of the disparities in the system. I can still vividly remember following a juvenile case and the client's mom telling me that she was constantly being, constantly treated badly and ignored and when she went, whenever she went to adult court. So I told her that the next time she went that I would go with her. Now at that time I had an intern with me and I remember going up to the court professional that was attending her case and that individual wouldn't give me the time of day. My intern's eyes opened wide and my client's mother said, Wow, she treats you the same way she treats me. Now, here we are, all three of us, women of color, a client, an intern, and me, the public defender social worker, experiencing the same hurt at the same time. And in my effort to try and shield the client and the intern, I said, oh, well, maybe she's really busy. You know, court is really busy, so she probably doesn't really have time to talk to us. Remember why we're here. We're here to advocate for, for your son, for our client. Um, let me just make a phone call. So I asked this particular court professional if I could use her office, her office to make a phone call to, to my office. And so this woman walked me to her office, opened the door, and had my intern stand by the door. And as she unlocked her door, she said, yeah, you can go ahead and use my office. And when she walked out, my intern heard her say to her secretary, watch them, my desk does not have locks. I saw my intern's jaw drop and I didn't understand what was happening. She looked at me and said, 
Isabel, she just said that we need to be watched because her desk is not locked. She thinks we're gonna steal from her. And I said, no, that can't be. So I walked out and the secretary was pale and she started apologizing profusely. I was in shock. My student was in shock. That's when we realized how bad it really, really was. And so I got back to my office and when I got back to my office, I was getting all kinds of phone calls. At that time, the office head was calling our office head, apologizing for what had just occurred. I had the office head had also called the main office and was asking them, telling them what had occurred. And I was being told to write a report, write a report. And so I did, I wrote a report. I kept it to the facts, exactly what happened. I didn't put any feeling into it. Something I learned from the defense, if you put feelings into it and don't state the facts, it's gonna water it down. So I didn't, I stated the facts. I wrote in the language that attorneys write in. And this person was forced to make an apology. But she was, it was a forced apology. And for some reason, forced apologies to me do not produce change. Additionally, the incident report stayed in the filing cabinet, never to be seen again, talked about again, discussed again, just sitting there. Through this work, I learned firsthand about systemic racism, desperate minority contact, advers adversarial systems. I also learned about effective collaboration, access to services, and the protection of rights and liberty. But most important, I learned about real world practice and how it's driven by theory, research, and policy. And that's actually where I found my love for teaching and the driving force behind the work I'm doing today. It all happened one day. I was busy and someone needed my help interpreting. Though I had already started to feel the pressures of interpreting and helping others, I quite didn't like it. But I couldn't say no either because I felt that I needed to help the clients. So this one woman asked, she didn't really ask, she demanded that I interpret when she wanted me to interpret. And I said, mm, no, I'm busy. Can we see clients? I'm seeing clients now. Um, can we do it at this time? And she said to me, no, you'll do it when I'm ready. So at that time I decided, oh no, I'm not doing this. So I went to my office and about an hour later, she comes back and she says, I'm ready now. And I said, so is the court interpreter upstairs. That's when she said to me, isn't that why you were hired? At that time, I asked her to leave my office for very professional, but there was an exchange of words. And I decided that I needed to do something about that problem. I wasn't writing or making a grievance or filing a report. Sitting in a filing cabinet that did nothing was not the way I wanted to go. And there were also other complications when it comes to that. So I decided I was gonna do research. I was gonna, well, I didn't call it research at the time because I didn't really like research, but I was obligated. So I called it finding out what's happening in other people's worlds particularly bilingual professionals. And what I found out was amazing. Everyone who was in my study was telling me all of these things that were happening. And so I put all the data together and I started presenting. I presented at conferences, I presented throughout judicial. And in 2010, something amazing happened. The judicial branch implemented a policy. And the policy stated the following. If you can go back a slide, that would be great. Thank you. The policy stated that bilingual professionals could not be used outside of their role to serve as interpreters. For the first time, I felt that there was a change and I couldn't believe it. Now, it was slow going, agencies and different departments didn't know the policy existed. So we had to let people know about it, but it was there and it had started to happen. 
And at that time, that's when I realized how important education was. I used education to change perspective, but also to cause a little fracture in the structure. And so that's when I decided I wanted to go and get my, my doctorates because I was like, wow, this is amazing. Look at all this stuff that education can do. And so I got my doctorates, but most importantly, through that experience, I learned that in order to be an effective social worker, you have to know how to navigate the macro, meso, and macro system. They all impact each other. There's not one way that you can work with one and not be working with the other. And so I needed to be able to bring that message out so that I can slowly start impacting systems one student at a time. And so my goal was not only to educate future social workers, but to develop a forensic social work program to prepare social work students to combat social injustices in the workplace, particularly legal settings. I wanted to change that system a little bit, at least one student at a time. I began researching forensic programs. Um, I was hired, you know, I was hired at Eastern and I was researching and looking for ways to make this happen. And then in 2020, everything started to unravel. The pandemic was running rapid, health and education disparities were on the rise, and the murder of George Floyd highlighted the real issue at bay, systemic racism. There again, the same burning sensation that I had in 1992 came up. I experienced the same exact experience and I couldn't help myself. Connecticut quickly passed the accountability bill mandating people, uh, police departments to work with social workers. And at the time, I was a field coordinator, and I saw it as an opportunity to teach students how to apply theory to practice in a way that was purposeful while addressing issues of equality and justice through education, practice, and research. So from my previous work in drug courts, I knew that I couldn't just cold, cut, cold call a police department. I needed to make a linkage, and that linkage was someone that I knew had a good connection with the police department. So I called them up and I said, hey, I want to know if I can work with the police department and help them carve out the role of social workers, but also help my students understand that system and be able to get the educational needs, met, their educational needs met. So she sent an email and connected us. However, I waited about two weeks. And I guess that was perfect timing because when I called at that time, I had luckily placed all my students. But two weeks later, two of my students did not have placements. It was the first day of school. COVID had closed down their placement. And so they needed a place. And I did what everyone does when they're in crisis. I called the police department. I said, I need help. And to my surprise, they called me right back. And when they called me, we began to work and I said, look, I have these students, I need help. And they said, well, we need help too. We need to do a feasibility study. And so we decided to partner. And from the very first day, the first thing we talked about was safety. How can we provide a safe structure for our students? Not only that, we involved the students in that conversation. And it was very clear that the student's comfort level was going to be their number one priority. Now, despite there being social police social workers in some states, there was really no roadmap for this in Connecticut. So we carefully combined our experiences, drug court experience with linking um, police departments with social workers, but also I use my public defender lens my whole career in the public defender's office was preventing people from getting into the system by trying to get them services, making referrals, setting them up with programs, even at times going out of my way to go and advocate for them in different agencies. And so I knew firsthand that we needed to safeguard our project. 
because as I learned in court, anything that you say or do can be held against you. And so I was fearful. I needed to make sure that I dotted my I's and crossed my T's, um, especially under the climate that we were in. So I reached out to my network, that network that I told you about, I began building. And so the first person I reached out to was my mentor, an expert in ethics and law and the undergraduate professor who had the attorney to attorney conversation with the public defender um, office to make sure that I can keep my placement, I reached out to him, Professor Robert Madden, my good friend and colleague. Then I also reached out to the formal, the formal state representative, Pat Wilson Phineas, who supported the accountability bill. I wanted to know the ins and outs of everything. And I called the public defender's office because I knew that if I did not see, or if I didn't understand all the pieces legally, I could end up with a police social work intern in court. And the last thing I wanted was one of my students to be subpoenaed into court because of an oversight. And so safety and guiding their work was super important because at any point, if a police social worker is even subpoenaed into court, that can destroy the trust of the community and the police department. At any point, a social worker could be used in court for or against a client, for or against a police officer. And therefore, if we're bridging communities and trying to build communities from the hurt and the pain, I needed to make sure I dotted my I's and crossed my T's. And so they were totally on board. We looked at different angles, ways to protect students from getting um, from getting subpoenaed, ways to implement policies that would protect the confidentiality of social workers, looking at the code of ethics. Um, but most importantly, I did what came natural to me. I knew from the very beginning that one of our guiding force in this was going to be the nine social work competencies. And police departments was the perfect place for them because you're able to deal with the community, deal with individuals, and policy is all over it. So you'll be able to address all of those competencies in your, in your learning. And so that was our guiding um, tool. And what was surprising to me was I sent over my syllabus to the lieutenant and the lieutenant sends me back a syllabus. And when I look at the syllabus, he used the nine social work competencies that I had highlighted and made a calendar plan for what the student would be doing including the policies, safety, all of those pieces that we had talked about. And I said, wow, I think I'm in the right spot at the right time. And so we began working. We did some serious onboarding with the students to make sure that trust was built. Um, I also connected with Steve Karp from NASW because that was important. They were also pushing for social workers to be hired by police departments or to work with police departments. And so it was important that, that he knew the kind of work that I was doing, particularly because I wanted to make sure that all of our students were practicing within scope, which is super important and part of our code of ethics. I wanted to make sure that we were avoiding any conflict of interest and that our safety policies were in place. And of course, no one better to provide safety than those trained by to keep the community safe, police themselves, right? Our program, began with just two students. However, today this program has already graduated seven students and is about to enter another cohort of students. We use the, what we call the integrative approach. An integrative approach means that the social worker or the police social work intern is embedded into the structure of the police department. They're sharing policies, they're sharing funds, procedures, that social worker is hired by that police department and their main person that they report to is the chief. Now there are many models out there. One of the other models that's similar to, to the integrative model is the collaborative model, which is when an outside agency outposts a social worker in a police department. And so they have MOUs or, spe or specific contracts that stipulate the rules of the collaboration. That particular model 
has a social worker that's paid by an outside agency. They're not part of the structure of the department. They don't share the same computer system. They don't share any of the things that um, are embedded into the structure of the department. What I've discovered lately is that many people um, are using the term very loosely. And so you will find contracted or collaborative social workers saying that they are embedded. And so now I focus on the word integrated and collaborative because if I'm doing research, I can't have someone tell me they're embedded, but be a collaborative model. And so I need to be make sure that it's consistent. And if that's the language that people are using, despite it being inaccurate, I'm going to try and meet people where they are so that I can collect accurate data. Now, since our students are embedded into the police department, it was very easy for us to make sure that we understood what they were going to be facing. It doesn't always make it easy when you are in the middle of a pandemic and trying to work on issues related to race. So we had all of our bases covered. Our students began onboarding process with the police officers. They learned about safety. They role played. They shared meals together. They did ride alongs uh, to develop working relationship with them and to build trust, but also to be able to understand how the department works and to help with the feasibility study. At that point, all of our cases, all of our bases were covered and we were ready for what I called Operation Boots on the Ground. And that means that while most social workers were working through telehealth, these two students, these two undergraduate students were navigating uh, one of the biggest political divides during a pandemic and they were on the ground doing it. In fact, one of the students had to trade her shoes in for boots to safely be able to walk through the woods with the officers to connect homeless individuals with resources during the pandemic. Since that day, a lot of different opportunities came up for these students. They got to experience so many different things and the police departments and the officers they were working with also saw how important it was to have these students, even though they were still learning, in the field with them. I'll give you an example. One time while on a ride along, one of the students, they were teaching the students how to be aware of their surroundings. And so as the student was practicing what they were telling them to practice, he noticed that there was a man who did not look well in his porch. And so he told the officer, that man doesn't look well. And the officer stopped. And when the officer stopped and they started to talk to him, they realized that the man was overdosing. So they immediately called the ambulance and were able to get the man the help that he needed. That occurred probably two or three weeks after they were onboarded into the field. And mind you, it took a little while for us to put them in the field. We were really being careful. So they didn't really start the field until probably middle or end of November. Um, I mean, end of October, middle of November. And so when that happened, we were very careful. We did weekly supervisions with the students, sometimes even more. Um, I was their LCSW supervisor and the Lieutenant was their task supervisor. We worked night and day to make sure these students had the supports that they needed. One of their first assignments was to find out if there were other states out there using police social workers. And guess what? They were. At the same time they were finding out who the other states were, there was a woman who also was looking to find out who was working with police departments. And so she contacted Steve Karp, who then contacted me and connected us. This woman and I began to talk and I wanted to introduce her to our students who also wanted to meet some of the social workers that they found through their search who happened to be her former students. And so we met and we connected. And when we connected, more people started joining us and we would meet every other month to discuss what was going on. And slowly but surely we had from six people to 10 people to 20 people. And now we have over 90 people that meet bi-monthly to discuss issues of social work and police. Most of them police social workers and officers, professors and students. And so our students were privileged to that. 
and they were able to to learn about their role within their scope and also educate themselves and 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 have the support that they needed the support became extremely extremely important because when you're doing this kind of work just to do a time check how much time do i have dr logan you have about five minutes okay so when you're doing this work it becomes extremely important to realize what is happening around you. One of the things that became really important was believing in myself. Because there was a lot of challenges, one of the things that I'm gonna skip the slide to is one, so this is what, perfect. So one of the things that started to happen was we actually ended up with more students the following year. And we needed to contact um, police departments who wanted so, social work students. And so I started to network with schools of social work, asking them to join us in this, in this process to be able to develop the field of police social work. This was extremely important because we faced challenges. Despite our program becoming nationally known because we were the first to actually um, produce a police social work academy, which is a week long program where we're able to train everyone to safely on board. Um, we were also the first in the nation to actually provide specific training between social workers and police. That came with serious challenges because people were threatened by it. If you can go to the next slide. I'm gonna say a few more slides. Perfect. People were threatened by it. One of the main things was people concerned that social workers would become cops. The reality is that social workers don't want to be cops and cops don't want to be social workers. So I was being challenged. Some agencies felt that the students were going to take over. One woman said to me, oh, you are what? Tell me exactly what you're doing. Send me the job description. Another woman said, well, why don't you not teach students assessments and only teach them referrals. Some of my students started experiencing it in the field too. One student introduced herself to a worker and the worker said, I'm sorry, can you paper? You can't even paper. And so in order to safeguard the students, I called for a meeting with this particular agency. This agency um, had a hard time with us and so I wanted to show that we could work together. However, when we had this meeting, they did not want their social workers to present. So I called upon the network and the network came on and they tried to show how police social workers work and how there's no need to be threatened because there's a lot of work out there. And so I'm gonna end with this. This work is challenging, oftentimes, you get tired. There are a lot of structural barriers. Many social workers have said, if you go on to the next slide, you'll see, um, many social workers feel that working in police departments is not right. That if you're a social worker and you're working in a police department, that you are working in a racist institution and that you're okay with it. The reality is that we all work in racist institutions. There are disparities in health. There are disparities in education. There are disparities in the criminal justice system. If we're not walking alongside our clients when they're facing the biggest hardship of their lives, then what are we really doing? We cannot close a door on a seat that has been open to us. It's important to remember that oftentimes, um, it's funny because my daughter would say to me, you know, mom, you're like the freedom fighter. But in reality, having to prove myself in drug court, having to prove myself in this space at times when people are questioning, what are you doing? Are the students doing this? Are they doing that? Um, almost feels as if I've been in prison since the, since, the education, since the start of my education and social work journey. It's always been about proving myself. My access 
depended on what others thought. Being a good employee meant I needed to go above and beyond. This will happen to many of you. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that it is important that you stick to your values, that you believe in yourself. If you go on to the last slide, that would be great. Uh, thank you. It's important that one of the things I discovered in this journey is the hardship of the journey, despite me trying to belong in other places and trying to fit in since the beginning, has never been about me belonging or proving myself. It has been about believing in myself. And what I discovered was mind blowing. See, believing in yourself means that sometimes you will work hard because there are structural barriers. However, you have to surround yourself with people who are positive, build your network, the people that will help you navigate those naysayers and remind you that, you're, that you need to be more confident. That means that you have to anchor your values and the things that you believe. And in, when you embark in this school year, remember, because social work is life transforming, it is important that you find your space. There's no way to build or break, there's no way to build or break um, systems if you're not in them to understand their structures, if you're not working alongside with people. And so therefore, if it wasn't for this project, actually, to tell you the truth, it wasn't until this project that I realized that tearing down structures has a lot to do with being able to say, I have a seat at the table and I'm not walking away. And so it's important that you do that, that you realize what that, what the, your values are, that you always speak your truth, that you're always credible and act professional, despite others sometimes not being professional themselves. Those are all part of our ethics. Um, despite the challenges that I face in this field, we've done really great, amazing things. And so as you move forward in this academic year, remember to always believe in yourself, form your network, never walk away from a table. And most importantly, remember that your, the way you handle the naysayers is really about believing in yourself. It is this space that made me who I am. And I'm finally seeing my value. I no longer listen to those naysayers that are trying to demand that I show proof. I'm too busy for the naysayers. We have work to do, and I know that you do too. And as you start this new academic year, remember to learn as much as you can and don't let anyone hold you back because they're threatened by you. Questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Logan. Um, we appreciate your being with us today and your presentation was extremely expiring, expi uh, inspiring, excuse me. Um, we thank you for sharing your work, your research with us and um, your speech was a great reminder to all of us. It's a great way to start our year. So um, thank you. We would now like to open it up to any questions that you might have uh, for Dr. Logan regarding uh, her uh, presentation, her work, her practice, um, anything that you would like to ask of her. Um, we ask that you type your questions into the chat and we will respond to them um, as we receive your questions. So uh, now is the time to, to do that. So feel free to type any questions you might have.
So I see one question regarding how many social work students have field placements in police departments. And so that may vary. So the students that have gone through our project, I can tell you that right now we have seven. Um, but there are students who are interning in collaborative models. And so I'm not, I don't have idea how many times they probably are working with police departments. And so that's why I think it's so important that we as the School of Social Work unite um, because we're able to track data better and are able to um, work together to really develop and sustain the field. How do you avoid burnout when working in such? So that's where your network comes in. How to avoid, avoid burnout? Your network is super important. Luckily for me, I have a very strong network. And so I will reach out to whoever I feel has, has that moment. Um, you don't want to burn your, your network out. So all of, your, all of your, the people in your community have different strengths. So use their strengths and call the people that you need for what, you know, for what you need. Okay. Um, how do you, so for the, if you're interested in interning in a courthouse, there is a website for the courthouse. Um, if you're interested in interning in the police department with the SWLE project, which is the um, program that, um, that has evolved from the work that I'm doing, um, we have a website and we also have an administrative assistant um, or a project manager actually now who um, takes um, all your information and there is a criteria um, that our website, I'll type in the website. So if you're interested, you can go into your website, into the website, but also talk to your field instructor, instructors because I am connected with all of them and we are literally trying to make sure that we have students that are a good fit um, because we definitely want to make sure we can continue to advance the field. Um, so connect with your field instructors or your field directors and they will connect with me. There's a lot on here, sorry. Trying to go as fast as I can. Do you know how? Do you know how many? Um, the next, the next question, Dr. Logan, um, is uh, the student is very interested in criminal justice reform and criminology. Where would you recommend uh, starting if uh, you want a want to learn more about this work? Um, their current field of placement is community mental health clinic. Nice. So, in the community mental health clinic, you will definitely learn a lot about um, the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, um, uh, some of our uh, clients um, experience crises, and if there isn't someone there to help them, oftentimes they end up in the juvenile justice system. But it's also important for you to also do your own research um, and reach out to individuals in the court system to find out how the system works so that when your clients are going through them, you can, you can be there to support them. Um, <clears throat> forensic social work is, is very um, important and that's the area that combines social work and law. So there's always room for social workers in the criminal justice system and throughout. Um, there's new placements now or new settings in the court, even in the prosecutor's office, almost every single criminal justice department has social workers. The only place that didn't, the only legal setting that didn't have social workers is actually the police department. So I hope I answered your question. Dr. Logan, there's uh, another question. Uh, from where does the funding come for the PSW program? Well, great question. Right now, the work is being done voluntarily. Um, we are not, none of, everyone involved is working because they really believe in this work and they want to get this work done. Um, I did apply for a grant. I am hoping to receive the grant. If I get the grant, we'll be able to provide more services and be able to 
have um, raised our training to the higher level. Um, but right now, this is part of part of my research. I'm learning from it as well. And um, I'm very grateful that I have really committed, dedicated individuals like the Lieutenant um, Robert Madden, who's part of my team, Bonnie Sullivan, who's my, our, the project manager now. She manages all my phone calls and my calendar. I never thought anyone could manage my calendar, but she's managing it. Um, and so right now, yes, this is all voluntary and just work, soul work is what I'm calling it now. Um, there's another question uh, or request. If you could uh, say a little bit more about finding your voice when it comes to advocating for yourself and asking for what you want to learn while you were a student? Um, that is a great question. Sometimes um, when you're in academic settings, and it can happen to us as adults or as students, as professionals, we often feel as if we don't belong. We're afraid to ask questions because we don't want to sound like we don't know what we're talking about or we're not, or we don't belong in that space. And so one of the things that I've always done is I just, I ask, because when you think about it, you are paying for your education and your money is going there. You have every single right to ask the questions that you need to ask. If you're confused about something, your institution has supports use them. Um, I also use my network. Sometimes when you're feeling insecure, if you have good people in your network, they're going to build your confidence and they're going to give you that nudge, like, go ahead, do it. Another thing for me was actually realizing that sometimes you're going to work really hard and you're going to have all the right answers. You're going to do all the right things, but there are people out there who who are stuck in their ways and will not, um, will not let you in. So don't give up, keep going, because sometimes you can't waste your energy on those naysayers. You have to say, nope, I need this. And so it's hard, it's not always easy. Sometimes I shed a tear or two, um, but you have to keep going. You can't let them defeat you. You got to use them as the fuel to break down the barriers that they put for you and for others. So, Dr. Logan, um, one of our attendees would like to know what made you want to acquire your LCSW. So, I'm of the I'm of the type that I'm always preparing myself for the future, and so I knew that I was going to enter a doctoral program, and whenever I was ready to go into academia, I did not want to lose touch with the practice world. And so before I started my doctoral program, I sat in for the exam that I was so terrified to take um, and got that out the way. And it was the best thing that I did because one, I never thought I would open private practice, but the minute I left and went into academia, the public defender's office, one, one of the attorneys there called me and said, hey, I really need you on, on a case. And I was like, but I'm not doing that right now. I'm trying to focus on, on this. He said, but I really need you on this case. And so I opened my private practice in two weeks and I started practicing. It actually helps. It's what I used when we went into online, uh, when we were forced online with COVID, I was running groups in person and I had to run groups online. It's what I used to keep my students abreast of all the new things that are out in the field. Um, so always prepare yourself. You never know what's coming ahead. Another question for you. Do you know how many MSWs are working for the CT departments? And is there a growing pipeline for internal supervision? Um, are students being hired yet? When you say CT, are you talking about Connecticut overall? Um, so I don't have the figures to that. I don't know. Um, the numbers, but I do know that um, there are uh, people who are working to make sure that um, when you graduate, that you'll have jobs. Um, 
Another question uh, in the police environment, how have you and others in the program been able to combat the resistance to police? Um, sorry, been able to combat the resistance to police social worker integrative practice. So that is an so one of the ways we're doing it is actually um, the project now has eight schools of social work working together um, to make sure that we're all training the students the same way and to be able to really collect data on, on how to develop this field. Um, one of the ways I've been able to combat that is literally through my network. And um, using even the, the network that we began that has about 90 police social workers, the reality is that as an educator, I will not water down education um, for anybody. One of the one of the one of the comments I got um, was a woman telling me that she wanted our students to um, to just learn referrals, to let the professionals take care of the assessments. And I said, social work students need to learn assessments. All of these students are, have LCSW supervisors. They're all practicing within scope. We have one of the best practice standards director, Robert Madden, who's a guru when it comes to et ethical practice and law. I have 20 years experience. We have a police officer. We have a woman who has an MSW and has an EDD who's, who's managing the project. We have all bases covered. Um, and it becomes interesting because I've been told straight out that people are afraid that they're that we're gonna take over. Um, my students have overheard comments, um, but the reality is that this is a space I feel comfortable in and I'm ready. Uh, another question for you, are there placements that focus on immigration, undocumented youth and families? Placements through the SWLE project, I can't tell you that we have specific placements for that, but I can tell you that all of our students can and will come across um, family, Im um, families that have immigrated from different places. One of the things that I'm really big on is making sure that um, our students use the, the language line whenever they come across someone that doesn't speak the language um, to make sure that they dot their I's and cross their T's. The last thing I want is someone being repurposed as an interpreter, a police officer being repurposed as an interpreter, and then someone saying that um, that they knew this information and so, or that the social worker shared information and that's why a person was arrested. So we really are really careful with those things. Um, and we will reach out to uh, individuals who are working in that field if we come across. Um, anything like that. Um, right now, one of the one of the things we do is make sure that if our students need extra supports, that they that we reach out with them, or that they reach out, particularly if it's an area that they are not um, versed in. So I believe that covered all the questions that were in the chat. Um, we do maybe have time for maybe one or two more questions. If any of you would like to. To ask Dr. Logan, please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, and Dr. Logan, there were a lot of comments and remarks uh, thanking you for your presentation and how inspiring and um, you know just the type of work that you're doing is 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 um, definitely something that I believe our students value and and uh, appreciate hearing about your work and experience. So. Um, I want to thank you again um, on, on behalf of the school for your uh, wonderful presentation. Very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Logan. I think that we should um, rename your talk today. And what I uh, recommend would be the remarkable career of Dr. Isabel Logan. Um, you have inspired me. You have challenged me. And I think from the comments and reactions and questions we're seeing, you have done the same for everyone um, who is involved in our convocation today. And I thank you so deeply for that. Um, you know, a couple of, of thoughts that I had as you were talking is I was so struck about your powerful use of your lived experience. 
um, in terms of identifying and shaping yourself as a social worker and how you bring that lived experience as a lens um, to the way you meet clients, the way you understand systems, the way you intervene in systems. Um, and, you know, you gave an account of a cascade, cascading series of microaggressions. Um, and those get tiring, I am sure. Um, but you also use those to motivate yourself to navigate treacherous terrain, to teach students, um, to educate others, and to confront them when necessary. Um, and those are so such, such critical kinds of activities um, for um, all social workers. I think the other thing is I'm so struck by the levels of impact that your work and you as a person have had on individuals, on agency practice, on systems, um, and on social work students, and again today on the students who are gathered here to listen to your message. Um, and I think finally I would say this is a wonderful example of how the social work profession and social work schools need to be responsive to changes in our external contexts. Um, and you know, we talk about these as emerging needs. Certainly over the last three to five years, there has been an increased understanding um, of um, the great amount of work that needs to be done within law enforcement um, and the criminal justice system. And um, the ways that you have talked about making sure you have a seat at a table um, and, you know, that call to students and the rest of us to make sure you do the same um, is uh, a message that I'm certainly taking away from here. And I hope that everyone who is listening again. So really from the bottom of my heart, um, I thank you uh, for being here with us today. Um, and I look forward to future conversations we can have about this project of yours um, and others. Um, you are um, a real gem in the social work community um, in the state of Connecticut and now beyond. Um, and thank you, thank you for being here with us today. I know it's the beginning of your opening uh, at your um, Department of Social Work. Um, and we're very grateful that you agreed to be here with us on one of the most important days of our academic career. So thank you. Thank you so much. I also just quickly want to share that two of my social work interns from last year were hired uh, directly by the police department. Um, the first pioneer social work student that started this whole thing in 2020 was just hired. And um, Milford also hired one of our interns. So there's room for many students to make uh, changes and make structural changes in a way that's positive for our communities. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Logan. Dr. Heller, did you have any additional closing remarks before we move forward? Yeah, um, again, um, I wanna thank everyone for being here. Um, this is, you know, always an important kickoff day for us. Um, and as you've heard from our speaker and you've heard from me and from our associate deans, from Henry, um, totally immerse yourself in this experience. Um, you will change here and you will change us here. Uh, and we count on you for both of those things. So as you enter classes next week, as you begin field placement the following week, um, just embrace every opportunity you have. Um, and please, again, reach out to your associate deans and dean, re reach out to the Office of Student and Academic Services, to the field department, um, and absolutely to your classroom teachers and your faculty field advisors. The only reason we are here is for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Heller. And again, thank you very much, Dr. Logan. Um, before we wrap up this year's convocation, there are a few um, announcements and updates that I would like to share with you. Um, again, I think we all feel that Dr. Logan did an excellent job in 
um, connecting the NASW Code of Ethics with her work and her experience and practice. And so one of the things that we want to make sure that uh, you all are aware of are the Code of Ethics. And um, there is a link to uh, the code on the School of Social Work website. Uh, but please know that uh, we will also be sending a link uh, where you can access the Code of Ethics both in English and in Spanish, if you would like. Uh, that link will be sent to you when we email you the survey and evaluation form for the convocation. Uh, this form will be emailed to all attendees, and we very much encourage you to complete uh, the survey and evaluation um, so that we can evaluate this event and, uh, and use your feedback to make enhancements to uh, future programs and future events. So you will be receiving that shortly from uh, our office, the Office of Student Academic Services. One of the things that we uh, want to impress with you, and I believe I mentioned it at the beginning of our convocation, uh, convocation is um, the opportunity to become engaged with the school. Yes, you are here, and we know that your classes and your academics are priority and are very, very important. But I believe that uh, there are other ways that you can engage with our community that will also just enhance your experience as a student here. So we have a couple of organizations that we very much encourage you to become involved in. The first one is our BSW Student Club, uh, obviously for undergraduate students. Uh, if you are interested in becoming part of that organization, you'll see the uh, contact information for the SWSA at UConn. Um, I encourage you to reach out to them and find information about how to become involved and how to become a part of that organization. Um, from my own personal experience, when I was going through my undergraduate uh, work in, in social work, um, I became involved with uh, my school's social work club and social work organization. And I can tell you from my own experience how valuable that was. Um, it gave me an opportunity not only to connect with my classmates and others, but it also provided me opportunities for me to grow um, and develop some of my leadership skills and leadership abilities. So um, I, I wholeheartedly encourage you as undergraduate students to become involved because, uh, again, it, it's an experience that will provide you and help you in so many different ways. If you are a graduate student in our MSW or PhD program, we also have a graduate student organization or GSO. And we encourage you to become involved and active in that. The organization does a number of things throughout the year. Um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, diversity, equity and inclusion events, uh, other types of ways to raise awareness in different areas. And so if you're interested, uh, I would encourage you to uh, consider being part of that organization. If you have questions or would like more information, there is the email there that you can contact or you can come by our office, Office of Student Academic Services, and we're happy to answer any questions and, and share with you information about that organization. Some of the upcoming events, again, other opportunities and ways that you can engage with our school. Uh, Hispanic Heritage Month is coming up. It's from September 15th through October 15th. And I know in talking with individuals here at the school, there are a number of activities that are planned to commemorate this and recognize um, the contributions of uh, Hispanics. And so uh, the uh, events will be announced. Uh, also, our Black History 365 education upcoming events will be announced as well, as well our Just Community. One of the ways that you can become informed of upcoming events and activities is by uh, checking the soapbox, which is emailed to you on a daily basis from our office. Uh, this is an opportunity that we let students know uh, what's going on and what's happening uh, within the School of Social Work, and that includes different types of special events and programs. So uh, I know that you're probably getting inundated with, with information and, and communication, but please make a special point to check Soapbox on a regular basis because it does contain some very important information that I think will be useful and helpful for you, uh, particularly as you engage with our school.
and then connect with us. We are on social media and you'll see the different platforms that we are active and involved in Facebook, Instagram. And of course, you can always email our office. Uh, we're happy to answer your questions and assist you in any way that we can. And then finally, before we close, I would like to extend a special thanks to uh, one of the members of my team, Kathy Burney. Um, she has worked behind the scenes this morning, doing all of the technical aspects of our convocation. And um, I want to express my thanks to her. Um, and she's been a, a tremendous help for me um, as I have come on board these last few weeks and learning what I need to know. And so um, I appreciate her and all of her skills and assistance with making sure that the technical aspects of our convocation convocation this morning uh, went smoothly. So thank you, Kathy. Um, that's it for us. We would like to end by just saying thank you for attending this morning. Uh, I, I hope this was uh, beneficial. And, and again, uh, Dr. Logan's message and presentation was certainly inspiring and uh, will help us go forward in the new academic year. So thank you all. I wish you all uh, every success and um, stay safe and stay well. Thank you.